Well, I'm Thomas Edward Whitesides, Jr. I was born in Gastonia, North Carolina in 1929, actually the week the stock market crashed. Then uh, I grew up through uh, grammar school in North and South Carolina, and my father, who had gone with Shell Oil, was transferred to Chattanooga, Tennessee, where I did my uh, junior high school and high school at Upper Macaulay School for Boys. In, Ch in all boys, private, military, Presbyterian-based school. Discipline was not a problem. That really greased the skids for me to get to Emory University for undergraduate school because my professor of science had gotten his master's degree in physics at Emory, and I was interested in that and knew that I wanted to go into some medical field or scientific field, and I came to Emory. And I ended up majoring in physics, thinking I wanted to go to dental school or medical school, but my grades came pretty easy, so I said, I can make it to medical school, so I went to medical school instead. And in, in, the, uh, in medical school, I really got a good background of all of medicine and, and all of surgery. That came up because uh, between the, the junior, between my sophomore and junior year, I had taken a job as an extern at Emory Hospital, a surgical extern. The Emory was not approved for enough interns to cover all the needs, so they hired medical students to work every third night and every third weekend and do workups, uh, start IVs, uh, do catheterizations, uh, hold retractors and things like that. In the first summer, I worked on thoracic surgery under, uh, under Osler Abbott, who was the chief of, thora of thoracic surgery, car cardiac and thoracic surgery. Then the next summer, I worked in Winship Clinic under Elliot Scarborough, and he and I got along famously. I had a tremendous respect for him and he for me, and he decided that I should go into, car into uh, onco oncologic surgery and was greasing the skids for me to go to Sloan Kettering and come back. But I got waylaid in the PGY2 year of a, of a I had interned in, in, in uh, uh, pathologies and had done autopsies and taught medical students in their labs and done autopsies with them and gotten an extremely useful background and it got me interested in teaching because I was teaching sophomore students pathology, uh, some of whom you probably know or have heard of. Any, in any event, uh, in my, in the, around Thanksgiving of my PGY2 year, Rob, Bob, Bob Kelly interested me in orthopedics, greased the skids for me to get a residency since his wasn't good started yet at Emory, had only occasional residency at, wa at one of the top five residencies in the, in the United States at Washington University, Barnes Hospital, et cetera, in St. Louis. And then after two years in the military, I came back and joined Dr. Kelly as the 27th or 8th member of the clinic. And I watched the clinic form during medical school and my residency years. In the five years I was gone, it had changed even a lot more, but I could, could figure it out and thought it was good to, good, a good place for me to land and have a career. Well, it wasn't around when I, for in, when I was in medical school. And when I started working uh, for uh, Dr. Abbott and all, and in that period of time, there was the thing called the private diagnostic clinic, which was the uh, a clinic that the uh, academi academicians at Emory Hospital, who also covered Grady somewhat, that was the uh, mechanism they had of uh, earning a living that the university couldn't furnish and Grady didn't furnish adequately. And so uh, <coughs> I ended up uh, hearing about it and uh, the Winship Clinic had been formed by, doc by doc Mr. Woodruff 
when he brought Dr. Dr. Scarborough to Emory to form a cancer clinic because his mother, Ms. Winship, had uh, had to go to New York for uh, oncologic treatment uh, for her malignancy. And they, that got him, Mr. Woodruff interested in Elliot Scarborough, who had an interesting background of go having gone to the first two years of medical school in Alabama, which had only a two-year school. And then he was from Alabama. And then he went to uh, Harvard for the last two years and then did his residency in, all in, at Sloan Kettering and came back. And uh, he uh, really impressed me a lot. I ended up treating both, uh, because of him, I, I treated Mr. Woodruff <laughs> and, and Mrs. Scarborough. And I uh, con consulted on him on occasion. And I knew Dr. Brown. Bob Brown, who was his partner, and also Sam Wilkins, who was born in Gastonia, North Carolina. And there was a little connection that way, though Sam was quite a character, quite different from the other two. A little more bombastic, but Elliot Scarborough was the kind of person that uh, anyone would shake his hand without even thinking about it, just on his obvious personality and his ability to get with, uh, uh, the, to relate to the patient, and the patients had fantastic uh, affection and uh, trust in him, and uh, really outstanding, and, and uh, he was a person who could, uh, anybody could work with and and he could he was just the right person at the right time for that and as Emory Clinic needed to broaden to to in, encompass more specialists and Mr. Woodruff built the building across the street which used to be a parking lot and when I was an intern uh, I lived in one of the uh, basement of one of the bit back end of the one of the Marriage Student Dormitories, which is now part of Winship Clinic, etc., uh, that worked uh, very well to, uh, uh, to well, that was still a parking lot at that time. And then the clinic building was being built uh, and expanding while I was in St. Louis and my two years in the military in Tokyo during the early part of the Nam, the Vietnam War. And I was, I did have some uh, experience in TDY to the Philippines, at, to the hospital there at the Air Force Base, uh, which was the own, the major U.S. Ho hospital just at the start of the NAM before we actually moved into forces in the NAM and hospitals in the NAM. Actually, while I was, just as I was leaving to come back to go to Emory, my roommate in the bachelor officer's quarters was uh, 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 sent to Vietnam in the first uh, VAC hospital that was built down, a tent hospital down there. That was, he was not excited. I was excited to get home. Because I was interested, I'd been interested in teaching by uh, working with uh, the pathologist, uh, Walter Shelton, who was the professor of pathology, Abner Golden and Heinz Bauer, who were the other, the other pathologists that taught medical students and did the pathology at Emory. And that pathology year got me interested in teaching, and then I, I got interested in teaching also when I was a resident, when I taught junior residents, et cetera, and actually taught medical students anatomy at, at Washington University. So I enjoyed that and thought I would end up doing well in an academic situation. Well, Bob Kelly was a mentor, and the, the other, the, and the second orthopedist was Sterling Ritchie. I learned a lot especially about hand from him. 
and uh, then I was the third, and the mentors that I'd had that made a difference were in high school, uh, the science teacher at uh, Emory the, to mentors to get good in physics and mentors especially in pathology through medical school and the ones I've mentioned to you. There were droves of them. I knew all of the early members of the clinic. Freddie Cooper, uh, uh, Dr. Martin, who became the chairman of surgery, he finally became a member of the clinic and a uh, and, and bunch of others. And I knew all of them that came along until I retired in, in uh, 2000. And that was a lot. I remember uh, pulling, helping pull a stunt on Willis Hurst was uh, a Chagas disease, which was an infectious disease in, from Central America, not, from, not an Ebola. And, but we don't see it in the United States, and, and it had a cardiac problem associated with it, and so they threw that one at Willis. And of course, he didn't get Chagas disease. Here. Who, who would run a fever, you know, five years ago, getting off an airplane from Africa? Who would call it Ebola? Well, it was a little better known than Chagas, but now it's extremely well known. Well, who did I hire as a <laughs> the one that just called me just a little while ago? Jim Robertson. Uh, he was the uh, he I hired him as a resident, and he when I was chairman of orthopedics, he was a resident, and I, I recognized his talent, and got him a fellowship at Mayo Clinic. And Mayo Clinic tried to keep him. Now Mayo Clinic doesn't try to keep many people who are from the outside. They all grow up there. Uh, but he was a good Texan, and but he wanted to come back to Emory, and he's done extremely well. He's uh, got just the right personality to keep other people in line and make an advance, and orthopedics has dramatically advanced. Lamar Fleming uh, grew up in Augusta, and start out as an internist and then switch to orthopedics at Duke. But he married a lady from uh, Atlanta who said, we're going to Atlanta. And so uh, uh, Bruce Loeb knew the family and uh, said, Tom, would you look at hiring Lamar Fleming? So I did. I hired him as a partner. I also hired uh, Hamp Holmes as, as a resident. He had gone, was the first black to go to Emory Medical School, and he uh, uh, was uh, a, a really unusual person. Now, I had a father-in-law who uh, never shook hands with a black until I had my father-in-law in the hospital, and he, uh, Hamp Holmes, made rounds with me, and, it, my, and Hamp held out his hand to, to Taylor, and Taylor shook his hand, and uh, I about fainted, <laughs> but, and, uh, but uh, Hamp uh, was uh, got, he, 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 he finished medical school at Emory, and his wife was from Detroit, so he went to Detroit for an internship, and then was taken in the Army and ended up in the Army assigned to orthopedics in Germany. And I got a message from him, I want to do orthopedics. And, and I knew who he was and all that, so I hired him a re as a resident. He wasn't, I th he was the first black resident we had, and I'm not sure he wasn't close to the first at, at Grady. Uh, close, but not the first. But he was the first one we had, and he was, to my knowledge, the first, when I hired him as a partner in the clinic, and then later got him a fellowship in spine, in Philadelphia, he, and he came back because his wife didn't go up there. She taught school right here in this area of Atlanta at Sarah Smith. And uh, she was a famous second grade teacher, teacher of the year several times. And I'm still in touch with her. But anyway, uh, Hamp 
uh, just had a way with people. He was very talented. He even operated on me. I don't know whether he wanted to or not, but he was selected when I had a, a, a septic bursitis here on my left elbow. And uh, the, all my partners looked at me and knew what, I was, what needed to be done, and they went outside and flipped coin or draw straws. Well, Hamp lost, and he had to operate on me. <laughs> but he was, he was, we could joke about anything because we used iodine to put on the skin, and it made it dark to prep. And if you didn't wipe it off or neutralize it, it would burn. And, 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 it, and using it on a black was a little different. You had to be very careful. And, and Ham just enjoyed the sun, you know, and he would darken in the summer and lighter in the winter. And I re- was very fire truck redheaded, and I didn't stay out in the sun at all. Uh, summer or winter, wore a hat everywhere, covered my hands with gloves in the sun before they had a good enough repellent. And uh, we could joke about uh, his, his getting tanned, you know. <laughs> and we, he, we said, we, ha, Hamp, Hamp said, you know, I guess I need to invent white iodine so, so we'd know where we'd put it in prepping areas to operate through. Well, now Asa uh, came to Atlanta and established uh, a residency and was a chief physician at, at the Hugh Spaulding Hospital, which was an all-black, was uh, built to be an all-black private hospital before there was integration, which it was. But they didn't fill it up. There weren't that many paying patients. And so the top floor which was the OB, was just empty. And the OB part for, for the black old Grady's was just overflowing. So OB was the top two floors of Hugh Spaulding. When I was a medical, when I was a senior, when I was a junior, it was in the old Grady. And it was wild, but we did a lot better over there. But Asa came uh, from the VA hospital in uh, Talladega, which was all black. And he had trained in Michigan, I think. Anyway, we've remained friends until his death quite recently. But Asa uh, came and was chief at uh, Hugh Spaulding and uh, did some training of surgical residence under him at Spal- Hugh Spaulding, separate. But then he became the first administrator, black administrator at at Atlanta, chief uh, chief of the. He became a, a a member of the associate dean of the medical school, but not a member of the clinic. And he became the chief administrator at Grady, and uh, retired as such. And as such, did not practice. But he re- he remained a, a really a resource at Grady, uh, and when Grady was integrated, that day was really interesting. Oh, <laughs> well, it used to be the black side and the white side, and we had a cl- white clinic on the black on the white side and a white clinic and a black clinic on the black side. And there were four wards. The whole floor of Grady was orthopedic. We had black, white males, white females, black males, black females, all four units. And the two didn't mix. We used the same operating rooms and the same nursing and all of that, but the floors were not integrated. Well, the plan for integration started in about 63. And this was started, and uh, Mr. Woodruff and uh, Martin Luther King had met it at the Capital City Club surreptitiously, and had uh, and 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 the Chamber of Commerce and all of that had figured out how to how to do this, and all of the plans were made. Now the faculty knew it. I knew it because, and at at about. Uh, uh, a couple, about a month and a half ahead. 
The House staff, some of them knew it before that, but the major house, full House staff knew it the afternoon before and were sworn to secrecy. Okay, no surgery was planned other than emergency surgery and deliveries and such and that for that date. And the patients didn't know it till they started moving beds all over the place. Well, well, that was interesting. Really, it went rather smoothly. Well, uh, there weren't many, so uh, uh, everybody knew each other very, very well. And, uh, and we worked um, between each other very, very well. The only problem I had was the uh, chief of neurosurgery was mad at me for doing discs. At the the uh, orthopedist at uh, at the neurosurgeon at Barnes, uh, they didn't want to see back pain. So the chief of orthopedics said, "You don't want to see back pain. We're not going to work them up for you to operate on." Tough. He had another word after that. Tough. Anyhow, uh, and he was a character, and nobody stomped on him. So we did 90% of the disc surgery there, and I did disc, and I and I ended up doing it all my career. But the chief of neurosurgery was most unhappy. I said, well, you want to see all the back pains? It's fine. Oh, no. We want you to work up the back, see the back pains and send them to us to operate on. And we had two words. One started with an S, one with a Y. I said, no way. But uh, at Grady, they did started wanting us not to do that too. So they had 20 back pains a day at the Grady Orthopedic Clinic. That's a lot. And the population was probably 60% black, 40% white. A ruptured disc is not all that common in the black. I don't know why, but it's not. That's been documented. And so uh, uh, they said, well, you can't do any disc surgery. Well, we won't see any backs. So they went from seeing 15 patients a week in the neurosurgery clinic on one day to getting 20 back pains a day. And that lasted about four months. And then we decided to split it half and half. And it's really gone to the point that, as you probably know, the neurosurgeons that do primarily spine have joined the orthopedist and are, have offices with us and go, come to our conferences. And their residents some, and fellows sometimes rotate among the others. And it has been a, a, an enlightening, very nice situation, the way it ought to be. It was more in need of space to start with before the building was built and then that let it open and then it grew and the, the hospital needed to expand which it finally did and uh, because the limit to the hospital size was a major problem it went from eight operating rooms to what 20 now I forget how many or I don't I hadn't operated for 14 years so I don't really there and then orthopedics has moved out and has its own separate place, which is going great guns. And orthopedics now is equivalent in size to cardiology and thoracic surgery put together, which is uh, uh, startling them. They're just opening their eyes. But that's the national picture. Orthopedics was held down by a lack of size and lack of space. And look what's happened since we got out of that. We outgrew our space in Emory Clinic and we had to move out our North Decatur Road into a building out there that was a bookstore. And then uh, after being there for 10 years, look, we went to Executive Park and now we've taken over into another building in Executive Park. We've filled up that building and now into another building. And the I was the third, and now there are 40 orthopedists. Wow. 
but it's 20, but 28 percent of people that come to see the doc, it's pretty steady. 28 percent of people that come to see the doctor have a musculoskeletal complaint, and it's not even in the in the uh, curriculum at Emory and about 60 percent of the medical schools. That's gradually changing, but it's so it's such a rewarding specialty, and and in uh, in all sorts of ways that we have no trouble getting residents, even that you can take it as an elective. But sports has gotten so big, and spine's gotten so big, and hand, everything has just ballooned. And uh, because of that, uh, uh, we have no trouble getting first-class residents. And to hell with teaching them in medical school as long as we, that's, that's really not the way it ought to be. But because uh, at Emory we give a course every year for uh, for pri primary practitioners in orthopedics because they don't none of them know it and they go out and see uh, private practice and look at all the problems. Well, I don't know how to handle this, so we tell them how to how to refer it. <laughs> then uh, they don't handle it much. In general surgery, used to do a lot of orthopedics, but uh, they don't anymore. And because they really weren't basically trained that that extensively in it. When I, when I was in medical school, there were no orthopedists in in there was one in Marietta, none in one in Rome, and that had just gone there, none in Athens, uh, one in Tomlinson, and and other small towns in the state. That was it. So fractures were treated not too well by general surgeons, and medical legally forced it out around. Well, it, it was uh, the ideas for that was to the teaching expanse of full-time university practitioners was needed. And uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, the need to have it organized in, in, into a, uh, there was the, the private diagnostic, uh, what did I call it earlier? Private diagnostic clinic. clinic. Uh, needed to have a better name. And you have Winship Clinic doing quite well on its own and organized quite well. Well, they needed to have an equivalent organization for, for everybody to that. So Dr. Scarborough got Mr. Woodruff to build the building and it just flourished and gradually filled it up and then filled up another wing and then filled up a third wing and then another building and then some of them went elsewhere like to Executive Park and like orthopedics and, and anesthesia offices are out there. So, wow, it, it just was a mechanism to do it. Now, it was separate from the university. The clinic was separate organizationally, monetarily, etc. You paid the university at, because they owned the building. You paid them 10% of your collections. It still does. But it does it under the auspices of Emory Healthcare so that it's not just the clinic. Now, my son, oldest son, started out working after getting his business degree, working for Barney Chisholm as a, a, in the business office of the clinic uh, as a buyer. Where he worked for, as business manager of the outpatient surgery and then became the chief of purchasing. Now he's the chief of purchasing for Emory Healthcare, which is the hospitals and other hospitals and other practices. So his job is he buys everything from paper clips to linear accelerators. And it's kind of changed, and that's the way the whole chain changed. Uh, there was a lot of contention as to whether it should be private 
separate from the university. And uh, uh, they finally made it happy enough that it happened. But it was a little bit contentious, but it came along. And it looks like it's worked. And it, it uh, has allowed the taking in of other practices in other hospitals when uh, that are not Emory Clinic staff physician-wise. But the clinic is made up of people who are practitioners and teachers and, and researchers. And private practice doesn't work well with all of that. But if you're a member of the clinic, you, you, do, you do both. And I did both. I, I taught probably 40% of my time and practiced 50 to 55 percent, for, for and that's how I made a living. But I didn't make as big a living as I would have made in private practice. <coughs> and I never, as chairman, was paid a penny by the University of Grady for being chairman. That doesn't go down. The chairman now gets a reasonable salary in addition to what he earns in practice because it takes time. No, I think it was uh, formed to, to uh, mirror what was going on in universities nationwide. It, it, private universities, uh, University of Georgia had a lot harder time of it uh, because of the fact that orthopedically, because it was remained under general surgery for a long time. But that nationally has broken out and it's, uh, now, orthopedics is bigger than general surgery. They don't know how to handle that psychologically too well. But they do. They're getting used to it. Well, it was, uh, what was going on nationally was that members of uh, our group became nationally active. And I became more nationally active than anybody, any of the first three or more for a number of years. That was because uh, I got interested in research and doing different things different and progressively uh, different. And I started doing anterior uh, surgery on the spine. That I was the first to operate on a fractured spine from the front. And that's due to the fact that I understood what, from my time with Osler Abbott as a student. And then getting interested, seeing tuberculosis cases in, in Japan and saying, you know, this is hard to get to the spine from the posterior lateral. I can't do it effectively. And in Hong Kong, they got 500 cases of, of skeletal tuberculosis a year, of which half were spine. And it, to treat them by posterior fusion and two and a half years of bed rest uh, just l didn't work. And so a Scot two Scotsmen, a, a thoracic surgeon and an orthopedist, said, why don't we just take out this lesion and freeze it from the front? Because the lesion was in the front. And they did that, and I heard about it, so I took leave and went down and watched them do three in three days, or four. And I came back and did something in that. And then I came back to Emory. Well, there wasn't much tuberculosis here. And Dr. Kelly got a compression fracture that was pushing in the, into the spinal cord and said, Tom, this lady needs one of your tuberculosis operations. And I did the first a corpectomy from the front in 1963 for fracture. And then I did the first front and back at the same time for another situation. And I got infamous, if not famous. And then I got on the certifying board because of my interest in teaching and testing. And I made up the trauma exam, oral exam, for the board of orthopedics for 10 years. Then I was on the board for 10 years in charge of the exam. First the oral and then the total exam committee. And so I was uh, famous for about uh, 550 people a year that got my signature on the wall and infamous for the other 60 that didn't get my signature on the wall. 
and I've met both kinds since. Tom Moore, who's chief orthopedics at Grady now, has my signature on the wall. He, he reminds me. I hadn't reminded him, but occasionally might. Made for an interesting friendship and a continuing involvement in teaching. It was uh, a little contentious all along, but it, they got along with, ended up getting along with each other. What, what well, the, the, the university is interested in the clinic for what? Teaching and money. What puts portion of the university spending in a year comes from the clinic and from research money that they get a portion of? A lot. A lot. And uh, I don't know that the clinic gets enough, rec people in the clinic get enough recognition for that. But, uh, uh, you know, when I would, things got in, because of Hillary Care attempt and all of that and, and the way things had to reorganize, the money I build, uh, uh, if I, if I build a thousand dollars, uh, uh, we would be able to collect 500. And our expenses back in 1960 were 20% plus the 10%. So I took home 70%. But if you'd only get 50% and then you spend 50% of that on advertising, I mean, I mean on your health, you got a, I used to have two helpers and then I ended up with many because of the, all of the paperwork and all that. Yeah. So I, my take home pay ended up as 17% of what I billed before taxes. So I had to bill a hell of a lot to take home a reasonable income. And it, and that is uh, the way she, that should not have happened. It, it, the way that ended up hurt, hurt, hurt everybody hurt the patients. I was paying $125,000 a year for malpractice insurance. Well, 100 to 125. And uh, I was sued three times and nobody collected a penny off of it. But that's wrong. This, and it, you know, it's, I pissed off about it. It improved because they were very dependent on us. And it worked better in, in time. And it works well now, I think. You see it working pretty well nationally with us on TV right now. Uh, their, their, their job has changed o over time. They've had more responsibility now than they had before. And the PAs that work with us and the nurses. And there were a number of them that worked with me and they remain close friends even now. When I walk into the orthopedic, to, to, to the, uh, orthopedic building and go to the spine area, I know all the nurses and they're friends and they've worked with me and I with them and uh, some for a long time. There's one there now that uh, goes way, way back to the night, back into the uh, 80s. And there's a PA there that worked with me from, from, for 20 years, it's still there. And, and they do great work and help a lot and expand our capability. No, I don't, but I imagine it was a pediatrician, but they, they didn't organize into, into the clinic directly. Uh, I really don't. I, I know there, there are a lot of them now. There are even female orthopedists, female or a spine surgeon, dear old Nancy Christian. No, 
I can't tell you exactly. The fact that we were able to expand and uh, teach and and do a lot better with our, our resident teaching and and uh, and the research that I was allowed to do because of it that helped make me famous or infamous, you know, depending on that. But it it it's worked out very very well. I mean, how how the clinic has the infectious disease people to, to do what they're doing right now. You mean, as far as patients go, do I have memorable patients? Yes, many. Even tuberculosis, syphilis, polio, things that you don't see now. Uh, and, uh, but they're still around and I, I use them to teach with, uh, I have 150 PowerPoints of interesting cases that I use uh, what, about one and a half times a month uh, on an evening with our fellows and the, the, what resident may be rotating on spine, but they're all spine. And uh, they're very instructive because you can't see everything in a year, and uh, so I, I have a lot of fun. It keeps my brain going. I still edit for four journals, and that keeps my brain going. I go to meetings, been, been Grand Rounds professors uh, three times in the last two years for different medical schools and programs. For being, in the board, being on the Board of Orthopedics for 10 years. Well, it's, I, I'm mainly interested in orthopedics, but it, it's getting bigger, and it's getting, it's staying good, and it's, it's got a good leadership right now, obviously, and that was one that called me, and, uh, and uh, I think it's, it, it's drawing great people to train, and it's making a big name for itself, and we're, we're making medical care better for people. We do a, a interesting case conference because our fellows can't see everything in a year and we, we save instructive cases for a very Socratic manner of, of teaching uh, and it, this is uh, is very interesting to them. And we use old cases and that are very interesting. I use, I sometimes use tuberculosis and uh, syphilis or, or, the, or especially things that we did back before we had CAT scan and MRI and show them that you can get along without that sometimes, but it's better with it. But if you don't, if you don't have it, you can sometimes do quite well. And this is a typical case of that, that's quite memorable. This is in 1993, and a 34-year-old lady who uh, had thoracic back pain with no radicular pain. In other words, no pain going around the sides and nothing going to her legs. And she had been treated for three months with various pills and physical therapy, but the pain kept getting worse. Well, uh, there's an idea that 90% of back pain gets better in two to three months, and you often don't need to do anything. But thoracic back pain that is, hurts when you get up, goes, it's better when you lie down, and it's getting worse, is different. And you shouldn't wait three months to figure that one out. Well, I saw her, and the problem turns, they, they finally got an x-ray at three months. And here's the x-ray, and it shows uh, that the, you can see this little round thing here that's uh, a portion of the vertebral body, 
and you can see it up here, but you can only see one at this level. This one you can't see. And you can see that there's a little bit of mass beside the spine. It's a, a little increase. And this is behind the heart. And when you get a lateral x-ray, you can see that this vertebra has been shot. Now you can do a CAT scan to see bone detail that's very good. And you can see that this vert vertebral body, this is what it looks like normally up here, dense, but right down here it's all eaten up. And this is obviously what you would see in a tumor. And she, but she had a scar on her neck. And she had a droopy eyelid. And the pupils were unequal. And this is called Horner syndrome. And if you take a good history, which somebody should have, 13 years ago when she was 21, they detected a tumor that was in the upper side of her neck. And it was in the carotid body. And this left her, because of the sympathetic nerves in that area, change uh, with a residual Horner sy syndrome. And she had a recurrence. She was back in college then, and she had a recurrence eight years later, and it was resected again. The, this tumor rarely metastasizes. But uh, here's, uh, they had just come out in, in London, had made an isotope which would go just to that tumor. So we got it and gave it to her. And then uh, here it shows that it concentrates in the liver and, ki and it's excreted by the kidneys and it, it's, it's uh, specific for, for a chemodactoma, which is what a carotid body tumor is. And so then what I do in teaching is say, well, what, what's your plan? How would you treat this? And here's the x-ray. You've got this tumor. What are you going to do? And they have a plan, and then they develop a plan, and if they make it wrong, we tell them, you, you didn't do that right. Let's do it another way. But then the lady, then I throw in the ringer. The lady says, she's six weeks pregnant, been married 12 years, and she and her husband have not used contraception. They thought she was sterile, but she's not. And they desire to maintain the pregnancy. Well, how do you maintain a pregnancy in somebody that's got an expanding tumor in the thoracic spine? You don't want to operate on them at six weeks. You want to take them to 14 weeks. And the baby has a much better chance of surviving it all. So the things got, uh, we also worried about the irradiation to the fetus because of the nucleus scan, which went in the ure ureter and into the bladder, and the baby got a little of that, but the baby only got eight rads, which is about like flying from here to San Francisco on, in high altitude. So that's not really that significant. And so we treated her with bed rest and narcotics until things got bad. And she did well for two months, and she did make it to 14 weeks, and she had early evidence of, tr of pressure on the spinal cord. And we did an MRI, which showed that this tumor is, here's the spine, here, and here's this mass of tumor pushing on the spinal cord. And here's the spinal cord coming down here and then gets squeezed as it passes this lump of tumor, which is pushing back against the spinal cord. So we went ahead, and here's it blown up, and that really shows it to you. So we did a right, we, it took bone graft, first because we knew we were going to have to do an interlesional inter clean out and it might be spread somewhere else if if we had uh, spread things around too much in cleaning it out so we obtained bone graft from the f fibula and from the uh, pelvis and uh, then we went in through the right side of the chest cleaned it out and put a plate in with the bone graft and the graft, uh, put the bone graft and also put the ground up bone around it from the front. And she did very, very well. And delivered a viable fetus prematurely at 32 weeks and went home, and the baby went home four weeks of age. And then three months later, we gave a radiation to the area with the radi neuroradiologist, I mean, with the <coughs> 
tumor radiologist with the modern ways of concentrating the radiation in, in the tumor and missing the spinal cord. That's important. And then I have a five and a half year follow up post resection with no recurrence, CAT scan and immunoradiography scan or nu nuclear scan again are, are normal. And this is what it looks like then. And the CAT scan then shows normal, but big amounts of bone. You can see the plate in cut, different cuts. And here's this bone graph like crazy and she drew it in quite well. Now, she came to see the, the oncologist in October of 2006 doing quite well. And I had word that she was doing well in 2010, and I hadn't heard from her personally since, the night, since I retired. So I chased her down and got a 20-year follow-up a year ago, doing well at age 54. Her first husband had died of cancer. She had married a widower with two kids, had raised those, and, uh, and then he died of cancer. And in addition, her sister got a similar tumor in her neck, and she's doing quite well. So this is a, a good case to bring up because it involves all aspects of the clinic. OBGYN, oncology, radiology, you name it. And in surgery, we had to monitor her anesthesia, we had to monitor the fetus, and monitor her. And two patients. Yes, that's right. So you have to do that. And you, it's quite interesting because pregnant women get an automobile wrecks and break their pelvis on occasion. And that, how you handle that is, is uh, very different. And you have to take care of both patients. And this is rewarding to me to be involved. This is what excited me and still excites me. And being able to follow up and talk to this lady 20 years later and she's running her second husband, late second husband's business here in Georgia. Thank you for letting me bring this. This helps keep me going.